How are all you beautiful people this morning? You're good? Yeah, we're good. We're good. We're here together to have a great day. And um, I need to just uh, welcome you here this morning. My name is David Hawes. I am one of the co-presidents of the Health Association of African Canadians, HAWC, and the other co-president, Mrs. Donna Darrell's, Donna Smith Darrell, <laughs> is there. So welcome, and this um, is a carryover from last night. Some of us are still on a bit of a high from our um, entertaining night last night, but I know today will be just as good be just as good. So this is a 2014 African Nova Scotian Mental Health and Addictions Initiative Conference. And you need to know, if you haven't recognized this already, that this is the first ever, the first ever. <laughs> and hopefully we'll have many, many more. It's like having birthdays, right? So we need to make sure that um, you know, mental health is very high on our radar right now. And there is a project that this conference has stemmed from, which has been going on now for um, the better part of a year. And we need to say thank you very much to the Department of Health and Wellness, who have sponsored this, have funded the mental health um, strategy and you know, there are a variety of projects that have been going on, and one of them is our project here, and this conference is, is related to that. So we're really very happy for that, and you'll hear a little bit more later on. There are a couple of things I need to tell you just very quickly before we get going. I'm sorry we're running a little bit late, but um, hopefully we'll kind of catch up a little bit later on. Um, if you haven't found the washrooms yet, just pretend you're going back to go downstairs but instead of going downstairs, stay to the right and keep going on the right, there are the washrooms. You've been asked to switch off all your cell phones or put them on vibrate. There are workshops going on later today and there are sign-up sheets outside of this room. Make sure you've signed up so that you can get into the workshops. There's a limit of 75 people per workshop and there are quite a number of you here this morning, which is nice to see. So you're not all going to get into one workshop. So spread yourselves out. When you look at those sheets, please do that. I think all the workshops are going to be good. You can sign up for the evening workshops during the break and during the lunchtime. So let me now introduce uh, um, a very special person to us, the Honorable Leo Glavine, who is the Minister of Health and Wellness and Seniors, and is the MLA for Kings West, as well as the Minister of Health and Wellness and Seniors. He was first elected to the Nova Scotia House of Assembly as MLA for Kings West in 20, 2003, was re-elected again in 2006, 2009, and 2013 with the larger majorities each year. He has always believed in serving others and his entire life has been devoted to public service. As an educator and school administrator, he was mindful of teaching to each individual's needs. He believed in the strengths of each student, and he also knew that part of his job was to be a role model. For this reason, he strived to set the example of a caring citizen who worked hard to achieve his goals. With regard to physical activity, Leo demonstrates his belief that physical fitness and recreational opportunities are important for physical and mental well-being. As a coach of multiple youth sports for over 30 years, he was tough but fair. As Minister of Health and Wellness, as he was when he was a coach and teacher, he has tried to model best practices. He has also served as a volunteer firefighter for 15 years, and I don't know how many people know how much stamina it takes to be a firefighter, but he did it for 15 years. As a firefighter, he was able to not only physically help victims of tragedy, but also to help them emotionally as well. And this demonstrated his passion for public service. As an MLA, Leo tirelessly represents his constituents 
and advocates for their needs. In his position, in his former positions as provincial health critic, education critic, agricultural crit critic, gaming critic, and deputy speaker of the House of Assembly, he had a strong, compassionate voice in affecting policy to improve the lives of all Nova Scotians. Leo has gained the experience and knowledge to affect change on a larger scale by meeting with and listening to people for many years. In his new position as a Minister of Health and Wellness, it is his goal to improve the lives of many without losing sight of the individual. Leo believes in the interconnectivity of all aspects of life and that the strength of one is dependent on the strength of the other. All departments and all people must work for one common goal, the improvement of life in Nova Scotia. So please welcome the Honorable Minister Glavine to give a few remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. David. Uh, uh, hopefully, I can live up to that introduction this morning. That was a, it was a, a wonderful recap of uh, many aspects of my life, many of my uh, beliefs, many of my passions that uh, I have worked for uh, over the years. It's interesting uh, to, to uh, when we think about uh, you know mental health and addictions. I, my mind first moves to to youth and to to students and. Uh, we know this is becoming and will be a big, big area of our focus uh, for the future. Uh, when, I, when I look back uh, right from the beginnings of my teaching career and through the years, uh, you know, there were so many times when you knew uh, that a child was in difficulty, but, you know, how do you reach them? Uh, what is the cause? And getting at that and doing something about it uh, has always, you know, captivated uh, not just my interest, but to move professionally to a place where we could do more in those very early uh, formative uh, years. So, so I thank Dr. David for for uh, making some of those references uh, this morning. Now, at the back of the room, and a lady who shouldn't be at the back of the room because she's top shelf in my mind, and that's uh, Patricia Murray. And uh, Patricia is here from the Department of Health and Wellness today. And uh, I certainly know how dedicated she is to uh, better mental health outcomes, uh, involved in the mental health strategy, uh, moving the addictions piece in a much stronger uh, path forward. So, uh, Patricia, thank you for being here uh, today. So I want to say, uh, you know, a welcome to all uh, who are here for the two-day and uh, the inaugural uh, African Nova Scotia Mental Health and Addictions Initiative Conference. I think this is an absolutely wonderful, uh, stellar, uh, you know, effort that has been made here. And hopefully it'll be one that, uh, in my understanding, is... Uh, as Donna said, growing as we speak, because there were others who wanted to be here today, uh, but they pretty well had a, uh, a full take up uh, of, uh, of people able to attend. So that bodes very, very well for this conference and for the future as well. So I'm very proud that the Department of Health and Wellness and the Health Association of African Canadians have been able to work together to make this conference a reality. This is an excellent opportunity to celebrate the work you've been doing to engage health stakeholders around the culturally specific mental health and addiction needs of African descended people. The Health Association of African Canadians has been working with the Department of Health and Wellness and with government as a whole to identify issues, find collaborative approaches, and build relationships necessary to improve uh, the health system. One of the, one of the areas that, uh, again, not being specifically in the, the mental health and addictions field and, and having that great respect and uh, appreciation for those who work as professionals each and every day. But what I have come to realize, what I absolutely know to be true, is that many, many more of us 
have to be engaged in the work of mental health and addictions in our, in our homes, in our communities, and in our workplaces. We can never, ever provide the number of professionals that we would need to do the job. There is absolutely no way uh, in terms of training them, in terms of being able to uh, finance their, their careers, and we know what great contributions they make. But the task is falling more and more to a wider uh, part of our collective. But one example of this work uh, to improve the, uh, the health system uh, is the development of training modules which engage healthcare professionals in developing their cultural competence to work with people living with mental illness and addictions. As you work through your agenda today, I encourage you to consider your role, your role in tr our transforming health system. As you know, we're moving Nova Scotia toward a more efficient, more effective, more patient-centered health delivery system that meets the needs of Nova Scotians across their diversity. The first step is already underway as the province is transitioning to a single provincial health authority plus the IWK by April 1st. If I thought that this was just part of a mandate, uh, part of you know, a direction that we go, in my 13 months as Minister of Health and Wellness and Seniors in this province, I get convinced weekly of the need for this. It is, it is on an unbelievable uh, moment, almost weekly, when I see how we don't work together, we do things in nine different ways. Uh, I can give you so many examples, and I don't mean just procurement. The way we can use our professionals to a, to a much greater degree and have an integrated uh, system it awaits us and it's one we absolutely as Nova Scotians need to embark on. This transition will reduce administration at its highest level and make sure that resources are focused on the front line where they are needed most. One provincial health authority will make sure that every Nova Scotian, regardless of where they live, will have access to a united health care system that puts patient care first. But this transition is just the beginning. The system also requires a significant transformation. The province is, is facing increasing costs to purchase much needed health care services. The population overall is getting older and the number of seniors who need support is on the rise. I just got back uh, around 2.30 last, uh, last night uh, from Ottawa where I was speaking at a long-term, a pan-Canadian long-term uh, health conference. And in that conference, there were a number of people who noted the area of seniors' mental health as one of those very significant and growing areas that we will have to address. African Nova Scotians and immigrants are younger, however, and growing more quickly as populations. We need to address the different needs of population across the age span, as well as the substantial assets they offer. Transition and transformation will take the pieces of the puzzle, such as mental health and addiction, and fit them together in a more efficient and effective way. That will not mean, however, centralization. We have to have a healthcare system that is responsive at the community level. Community health is the way of the future. How much can be done in your community for positive mental health and addiction outcomes? We cannot send every child to the IWK as much as we may have some of our top people there. It will be people in communities all across Nova Scotia who will make much of this big change that we need to, to undertake. 
So as your day progresses, I hope that uh, the ideas of transition and transformation will be present in your discussions and presentations on how we can do a better job in supporting African Nova Scotians specifically with mental health and addiction problems. Having a sustainable system in place will make it easier to build strong public policy, support a culture of health and wellness, and help make life healthier and safer for everyone. This is not a pipe dream. The concepts of wellness in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities must become very real very and a very living daily agenda that we all need to be part of. As I went across the province last year, over three and a half months, meeting literally several thousand Nova Scotians, many stakeholders in health, and one of the realities that they presented to me is that we indeed, the statistics that we have about high rates of chronic disease and uh, mental health issues and addictions were very real, and they were presented to me in the most real fashion. And I know that we can do better as a province. We have great resilience. We can create great resolve to make the kind of changes that we will need uh, to make. I believe we have to put forth a culture of wellness in that fullest extent. While well, I believe in improving and nudging ourselves along a little bit to improve physical well-being, which is really part of a strong, you know, can be and should be part of a good mental health outlook, but also, you know, our spiritual values need to be incorporated in that whole holistic picture of what can be a better uh, uh, Nova Scotia if we subscribe to this. For far too often, our physical and mental health has not been given that kind of place. It hasn't been the sacred value that we really need to give it. And that's where from early years through the life cycle, we have to be engaged and partnering for a stronger, health, uh, healthier Nova Scotia. So I hope you have a great day. Thank you all for the work you do to make Nova Scotia a better place to live. This is a wonderful beginning in this room here today. Thank you very much. Thank you for those words, um, Minister Green. So we're gonna move right along now and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kwame Mukenzi. Kwame, as he um, prefers to be called, is an international expert on the social causes of mental illness, suicide, and the development of effective, equitable health systems. As a physician, psychiatrist, researcher, and policy advisor, Dr. Mackenzie has worked to identify the causes of mental illness and in cross-cultural health for over two decades. He's an active, funded researcher of social, community, clinical, and policy issues, and has nearly 200 academic publications, including four books. He has set up award-winning services. He sees patients and trains clinicians and researchers, as well as developing health policy for governments. He has international experience in Africa, Europe, the Caribbean, and the United States. After completing his medical training at the University of Southampton, Dr. Mackenzie undertook psychiatric training at the Maudsley Hospital and Institute of Psychiatry, UK, and Harvard University, US. In addition to joining the Wellesley Institute as CEO in March 2014, Dr. Mackenzie's medical director responsible for dual diagnosis, child, youth, and family and geriatric services, and director health equity at the Center for Addictions Mental Health in Toronto. He's a full professor and the co-director of the Division of Equity, Gender, and Population in the Department of Psychiatry. He's the president of the Canadian Mental Health Association, 
in Toronto, sits on the board of United Way, has a key role in development of mental health strategy for Canada. We just want to give you a picture of who he is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So how do I get this one on? Wonderful. So um, you thought that it was going to go on to tell you the name of my cat. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I was, I was a bit worried because I was told I only had an hour. And it looked like about 15 minutes was going to be taken up uh, telling you who I was. So you, you can read who I was, the, the, the bios there. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, the minister for his words and also uh, the, course, the uh, conference organizers, because I know you've been working really hard, uh, not just on the uh, conference, but also to launch uh, what is needed uh, in, um, uh, in Nova Scotia. Now... I've been in Nova Scotia once before, and when I was here, it was the day after, um, it was the day after St. Patrick's Day, wasn't it? It was the day after St. Patrick's Day. And the, the, the people who were in the conference looked like a scene out of the dawn of the undead. <laughs> um, there was no response at all. Um, and, and so I've, 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 I've come here partly because I, I need to expunge that uh, feeling. I understand that people out east are chatty, and um, uh, you know they talk, and there's lots going on, but it was just a sea of post-alcohol, as far as I could work out. So, so very odd. So, in order to make sure that um, we're on the same page, I wanted to uh, remember that one of the things that sometimes happens when we're thinking about mental health and when we're thinking about mental health services and we're thinking about cultural competence is we get into the what. But the thing that takes us to the next level and the things that sustains us is the why. Why are we doing this? What is it, you know, why are we here today? And we're here today not just about mental health services, we're here really thinking about the future. So because I was worried that people might not talk, the first thing I thought I'd do is just ask people, what do they think the most important things are for Canada's economic development over the next 50 years? Oh, now look, it's gone into the undead again. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is it's conversation, I talk, you, you, you reply, That's, that works. So... Education. Education is the most important thing for economic development. That's one of the biggest risks we've got. Yeah? Okay. Anything else? Healthy citizens. So health in general. Healthy citizens. People uh, developing. Yeah? Population that sees itself as part of a global community. Globalization. Global community. Thinking about a population that's uh, attaching itself to uh, all of the different... Um, uh, availabilities, all of the different possibilities around the world. Yeah. Have a clear understanding, of your assets. understanding who you are, understanding what your assets are, and building on the positive, and trying to move forward that way. That's that's important. Resilient communities. Okay. So resilient communities in uh, Dominica, where. My parents are from when you go to people and you say, how are you? People tend not to say, I'm great, blah, blah, blah. They say, taking blows. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's when you stop taking blows that the problem uh, is. So anything else? Good jobs. Okay. A good economy. Good jobs come from a good economy and a caring government, obviously. Anything else? Justice. Speak up. Social justice, so moving together rather than moving apart. I'll tell you what people usually say. The world economy, they say, what we do about the baby boomers, because the baby boomers are getting old. And uh, that means, and I, I'm apparently at the bottom end of the baby, baby boomers, so I'm still counted as a baby boomer. But there's this population bubble that is going away. And how do you fill uh, but, you know, how do you fill that void? Raw, mate raw materials. If you'd have asked this 10 years ago, everybody would have said global warming. Uh, global, and if you're in Buffalo, 
last week, you'd have said global warming, most definitely. Uh, and then, particularly in Canada, people talk about multicultural and uh, multiculturalism. But I actually think, and many other people do, that this is the most important thing for Canada's future, preserving Canada's mental capital. And, and I'll explain why uh, during this uh, talk. I'll talk a little bit about mental capital and efficient health services. I'll talk a little bit about some research that we've been doing in, in Toronto, really, that's about health services itself. And then I'll throw out some uh, ideas, some things that we've been doing that what I want you to do is listen, steal, and do something with them. Uh, just steal them, okay? So that's what I'm going to talk about, mental capital. About seven years ago in the UK, they got 400 scientists together. And the government asked them a simple question. What is the most important thing for our economic, um, our economic viability? And the academics, some of them said, they all said, well, you know, as a high income country, there is no way you're going to be able to out manufacture low income countries. You're just not going to be able to do it. The way we're going to move forward is with our smarts. The way we're going to move forward is with our brains. And um, when they looked into the academic literature, they said, well, schools are very good at developing people's IQs. But if you've got the same level of IQ, so the same level of intelligence, the thing that makes a difference is your emotional intelligence, your EQ. And none of it makes any difference if you haven't got your mental health. Okay. Now, EQ is interesting to me because a lot of people say, well, what are you really talking about? And the way I think about it is the difference between uh, IBM and Apple. Okay. So, <clears throat> who had the iPad first? Who had the, ta the tablet first? IBM. IBM had it first but they had no idea what to do with it, okay? So they had the smarts, they had the information, they had the technology, but they had no idea what to do with it. Apple didn't have the technology, but they knew what to do with it. In fact, they know what you want before you know what you want. Then they sell it to you, then it stops working, and then you buy it again, <laughs> yeah? Because they know how you work. Because they've got EQ. They've got emotional intelligence. They don't even talk about the idea of, um, you know, if you talk to IBM stroke Microsoft people, they're all about how this works, how that works, whether you can do this, whether you can do that. At Apple, they talk about your ex the experience you have when you turn on the c your computer. Because they're about your emotional intelligence. It's about the experience. And I actually have a couple of geek friends who were, cause, they were making no money down in Silicon Valley until they had this EQ moment. And their EQ moment was they realized they didn't have any. Yes. <laughs> and so they said, we need to get a psychologist like Dr. Nichols or any of the others to, to come and help us with the EQ bit. And if we can get help with the EQ bit, we can actually work out what people want. We can work out this thing that the gentleman here was talking about, about sort of building on our positives. And uh, now I used to be able to joke about them. Now I'm jealous of them because they're millionaires. But there you go. Yeah. That's what happens. IQ, EQ, mental health. Anything that gets in the way of the development of your EQ and anything that gets in the way of the development of your IQ increases your chance of developing mental health problems. Okay? You can develop and preserve mental capital by developing resilience. And the easiest way of de developing resilience before the age of five is by developing and building social brain. And the way you build social brain 
uh, often is by what they call serve and return interactions that you have with your parents. So you're a baby, you do something, the parent does something in return, you build social brain. You keep on doing that, you build more and more social brain. Anything that gets in the way of the development of the social brain, having to work two jobs as a parent, uh, having a mental health problem as a parent, poor nutrition, too much stress of a parent, causes a problem with the development of the child's social brain, which makes them vulnerable to uh, not having, not just the IQ, but the EQ and the mental health resilience that you need to move forward. You can catch this in schools. So you can, you can develop resilience in schools. You can develop cognitive behavioral therapy techniques in schools. And I'll tell you a little bit about a piece of work we're doing in Kenya, where we're doing that later. You can go further than uh, waiting for things to go wrong by developing uh, communities that build resilience. And, and I think uh, Michael Unger is really interested in that from Dalhousie. And there's a whole conference in Nova Scotia, so that will be my third time. Um, uh, uh, about that uh, this year. Parents, you can develop uh, IQ, EQ, and preserve people's mental health by making things make sense for parents. And I really like this idea of coherence because uh, coherence is an idea, is a psychological idea, isn't about everybody having the same. It's about the effort that you're going to be putting in to your life making sense. And when things don't make sense, when the rules change on you quickly for no reason, when you feel completely disempowered, when things do not make sense, that's when things go wrong. Um, and I like the idea of appropriately stressful communities. Uh, I, I am uh, I'm still plagued by uh, the loss of the maple leaves to the Bruins in uh, uh, two years ago. Uh, I was sitting in an Ottawa bar, the only Toronto fan, uh, in Game 7, happy that they were going to move on to the next level of the playoffs, and really happy with 10 minutes to go when uh, they were winning, uh, I think, 3-1 or 4-1. I can't even remember what it was. Uh, I'm so scarred. The memory's gone. <laughs> Actual memory's gone. And what they showed was something called... Um, the stress performance curve. And the stress performance curve says, this is your level of performance, this is your level of stress. As your level of stress increases, so your performance increases. And that's fine. And that was 1-0, 2-0, 2-1 actually, 3-1, their performance was increasing. Then, as the level of stress increases, your level of performance tails off. And then when you get to the last 10 minutes, you choke. <laughs> performance dies, you lose, and you're out of the playoffs. And that shows that you need a certain amount of stress to be a high-performing um, community. To be a high-performing country, you need a certain amount of stress to produce that ingenuity but too much stress and your performance tails off really quickly. So the real question for building IQ, EQ and mental health is how you can have enough stress so you can push things forward. Stress isn't necessarily bad for you, yeah? but not so much stress that people start getting ill. And so appropriately stress the stressful communities. Um, but then when things go wrong, catching it early so that you can repair and you can build people and you can move people forward. And really linking to what the um, uh, minister said, people always think when they're thinking about mental capital, people always think about building it in youth. And that's important. People talk about early intervention and stopping uh, youth getting ill or adults who are at working age getting ill. And that's important as well. What people forget is that there is a huge amount of mental capital sitting in seniors. And, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm starting to say this is the most urgent need that there is. <laughs> um, but, you know, there is a huge amount of mental capital in seniors. So as we get an older population 
And uh, in Toronto at the moment, uh, in Ontario, we're in a situation where one in seven people are uh, over 65. In 2040, we'll be at the situation where one in four people are over 65. So we're going from, uh, we're going up to 25% of people over 65 in the, next, um, uh, in the next 30 years. So we've got to think about this and we've got to think about how we don't lose all of that intelligence and all of that experience and all of that knowledge. So we've got to think about what we can do about early dementia. We've got to think about keeping people, we've got to think about treating diabetes and treating hypertension, because that increases your chance of developing memory problems. We've got to think about early intervention in seniors in order to hold on to the IQ, the EQ, and the mental health, the mental capital. We are not going to out-manufacture low-income countries, but we are going to outthink them if we um, hold on to our uh, mental capital. And that's what they were thinking in the UK. The reason why this is really important for diverse populations is because of one of the things that uh, Robert said. Cities of the future that are going forward, countries that are going forward, are arrival cities and arrival places. They're places that are networked within the world. And uh, I had, I had the, one of the senior people from um, uh, CNN over to Toronto, and I was sort of saying, you know, what are you doing here? And he was saying that diverse cities are the future, and diverse countries like Canada are the future. And, and they're saying, well, I thought that was interesting. Then I was speaking to the head of BMO, and he was saying they move their senior executives through Canada. They said, because in Canada, you have the East Asian market, you have the American market, you have the European market, and you can learn everything you need to know about the world in Canada. Yeah. And so this idea of this diversity and being able to look after diverse populations is important. As the minister said, immigrant populations and diverse populations are younger, so there's an imperative there about looking after our IQ, EQ, and mental health. Um, but then population growth in Canada is mainly based on immigration. That's our big population driver. If we do not want to be, um, uh, apologies, but an annex of America, um, uh, I'm apologizing to Dr. Nichols, who's from America. If we, if we keep on getting smaller, uh, we will be another state of America, we'll be taken over. That's what's going to happen. There are only 37 million of us, and there are 300 million of them. Um, we have to grow to be big enough that we can survive that. Uh, and there's money, and there's raw materials, and there's water here. Uh, a third of the um, potable water in the world is sitting in Canada yeah, for a very small percentage of the, population, of the population in the world. So we've got to think about Canada's diverse population, how we grow it, how we look after it, and how we build on it, how we build on our strengths, and the diverse populations are our strengths. Anything that threatens uh, our mental capital threatens our economic growth. Simple as that. Anything that threatens our mental capital threatens our economic growth. And anything that threatens the mental capital of our diverse populations especially threatens our economic growth because Canada was always and has always been a place of immigration. I was saying to um, some people last week that if you reflect back, and you reflect back 100 years ago, the rate of immigration to Canada 100 years ago was higher than it is now. As a percentage of the population, there were more immigrants coming to Canada in 1914 than there are in 2014. And those people came to Canada in order to build a better country, in order to build a better place, in order to have a better life. And I think uh, going from that sort of a start to being a G8 country in 100 years, I think they did pretty well. Yeah? You'd agree? Not, not too shabby. Yeah?
Not too shabby, Canada, not too shabby. So what about the next 100 years? Same people, immigrants, same dreams, you know, same natural resources, same possibilities. What do we want? And this is, you know, how do we build it? What are we doing here? Why are we here? We're here about the future, as we always have, as we always have been. This is a problem. Um, it's a problem because anybody who ever puts up a graph and then says, this is a difficult graph to read, anytime they say that to you, say, don't put it up, okay? Very simple. <laughs> so this is a difficult graph to read, okay? <laughs> but all it shows, all it's doing, is it's looking at the health and mental health of different immigrant groups and following them up over a five-year period. We, uh, this is in social science and medicine. And uh, people have always told you that immigrant, uh, new immigrant groups get ill when they get to Canada. And we wanted to see whether all immigrant groups uh, have the same trajectories. And so we broke it down depending on where people were from. And the top is uh, women, the bottom is men. And what we found was Chinese, South Asian, and African men do worse than any other group. The trajectory of developing poor health and poor mental health for these groups in Canada is worse than any other group. That's all this shows. It could be because um, of some social trends that are happening being uh, the lower rate of incomes. All this graph is showing is showing the percentage earnings if you compare um, immigrants versus Canadian-born people between the 1980 to 2005. And the different lines are just whether you're a man or woman, whether you've got a degree, whether you haven't got a degree, and it's just showing a comparative analysis. And so over time, if you were a woman without a university degree, in 1980, you were earning about 85% that uh, a Canadian-born uh, person was earning. You move forward to 2005, you're down to 55%. Yeah. That is going to have impacts on not only your mental health, and remember, your mental health, then you have to work two jobs, your stress levels, then what about the kids, and what about the development of their social brain? But there are other things that happen in Canada. It's not just the socioeconomics. It's also um, you know, the impact of racism. This is a study, and I put it up just for two reasons, because it gives an opportunity for how one might intervene. This is a, a study by Pasco and Rickman uh, out of Duke University. They looked at every study there had been on racism and health and mental health. They were interested because um, their sort of slightly geeky um, 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 epidemiologists, they were really interested in trying to look at whether um, racism leads, is associated with um, physical and mental health problems and whether that is just due to stress. And they found some support for that. But one of the things they didn't think of, but the literature seemed to show, was that was one pathway. So racism stress leads to physical and mental health problems. But they also found a completely different pathway, which was the reaction to racism stress, independently leading to physical and mental health problems. So I feel stressed, I do something about it. Maybe I smoke, maybe I drink, maybe I uh, get involved in some, um, uh, some high-risk uh, practices, and those have an independent link to my rates of physical and mental health problems. So that's what they found. But then, in Toronto, there are other things going on top of that. A chap called David Helchansky, who is a, um, a, a, an economist and a geographer, wanted to look between 1970 and 2005 at um, what was happening in Toronto, what's happening with regards to incomes in Toronto. And he came up with the idea that there's not one Toronto, there are actually three Torontos. There's City One, 
And in City One, over the 35-year period, people have had a 40% increase in incomes in relative terms. There's City Two, where it's flatlined. Compared to everybody else, there's been no increase. And in City Three, there's been a 20 to 40% decrease in incomes over that 35-year period. So what's happening in Toronto is increased income inequality, increased polarization, to the point where in 1970, 66% of, Toronto, of Toronto's neighborhoods were middle income. By 2005, 29%. If you go down to city one, after tax, the average income was uh, 88,000 in 2005, but 27,000 in city three. And it's becoming worse. And income inequality is a social cancer. Not only does it decrease the income revenue, and, and you can see over Canada in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, the actual amount of tax that's been paid, though everybody thinks they're paying more, the actual tax revenue has decreased by 13% over that amount of time. So there is actually less money for government to spend, uh, partly because of income inequality. Ah, but what you can't see, because that hasn't come up very well, is that in city, in Toronto, in city one, city one is 84% white. City three is 40% white. City one is actually um, 3% black, and uh, city three is 35% black. And so slowly but surely in Toronto, partly because of income inequality, um, we're segregating. And that's, what the, and that's what's happening. And nobody is trying to do this. Nobody is trying to produce a segregated Toronto but the economics are making this happen. So there are lots of these drivers, and you can think about uh, what happens here. So one of the things that happens in Toronto, as soon as I put this up, I go back to people and I say, what was the first thing you thought when you looked at that? What do you think they say? Sorry? So, so if I put this up, and I put this up of Halifax and Dartmouth, and I said, there are three cities. There's this rich city, a middle city, and a poor city. What would be your, the first thing you would do? See where you live. <laughs> yeah. And that's the first thing. That's just natural. That's human nature. The first thing is where you live. Okay? Uh, and the second thing, if you're in city three and you're smart, is how do I get out of here? Okay, so what you do with income inequality is you end up producing a concentration of power, money, and influence in one city, and the other city gets forgotten. And that then produces more and more income inequality to the point where you can be sitting in city three, and if you want to get a, if you want to get a doctor's appointment, good luck. If you want municipal uh, services, good luck, and uh, you can get them, but you're taking two buses, there's no subway. Um, you're using more time, you're getting more stress, and so you can end up with city one being a city with just the amount of stress, and city three being a city with too much stress. And you can imagine what that does long term to the development of the children to the development of yourself. So this idea of coherence, does it make sense that I'm putting all of this effort? And so you can see how that uh, causes problems or could cause problems with IQ, EQ, and mental health. The problem we have in Toronto is that over 50% of our children live in city three. So, and one of them is going to be the next Bill Gates. And they are connected to the global economy, and they are our future. So if we carry on like this, 
makes no sense. We're undermining our IQ, EQ, mental health. We're undermining our development, but we're undermining our future. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. So you're probably asking, what is he talking about? And what I'm talking about is the why. Why this is a big thing. Why uh, I'm happy to get on a plane and come here. Because this is really important stuff. Uh, IQ, EQ, mental health, this is really important, not just for people with mental health problems, not just for communities, but for Canada. This is really important. And it's really important for health services. If you want to get things right and have an efficient uh, health service, and we were talking and the minister gave a great talk, and one of the things he said over and over again was, we're going to have an efficient health service. And I'm thinking, when I think health services, I don't mean illness services. I think illness services and health services. So uh, you have to try and prevent people getting into services if you want the things to work properly. This is what you have at, we have at the moment. I don't know whether it happens here, but it happens everywhere else in the world, and uh, Nova Scotia is part of the world. So I think it's a reasonable bet to say that you have the inverse care law here, okay? Where this is, you have the service amount and you have the measure of need and they don't align. Generally, for almost every health service, uh, the people with some need but not the greatest need get more service than the people with high need. And that can be due to barriers to care, that can be due to lack of cultural competence, that can be due to linguistic barriers, that can be due to financial barriers. And that is why you get differences in survival from cancer and various other things dependent on people's socioeconomic um, uh, uh, position. And, and of course where you want to be is like that. You want to have service and need uh, aligned so that people who can help themselves help themselves and people who really need help get a lot of help from uh, the system. But we tend not to do that as much as we could. And part of the reason we, do, we don't do that is we focus a lot on illness rather than thinking about health and we focus on the most ill um, rather than trying to think of how we can promote and prevent uh, problems. So if we wanted to get good alignment so that we brought the health of African uh, Canadians up and to the health of other people and services were um, at the same, at the level based on need, as a, uh, the, then we would think about prevention. We would think about health promotion. We would think about early intervention we would really think about how we support families. And then we would think about um, how we think about uh, recovery uh, through adaptation and development of uh, the human potential. That's what we would do. We would actually look and say, what are the problems and what are the solutions? And what usually happens because in, in health is we usually wait till things are broken and try and fix them rather than getting up uh, upstream, okay? Now, you've probably heard the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. True? Yeah, everybody's heard that phrase. Reasonable thing, yeah? Yeah? yeah. Nonsense. Total nonsense. If it ain't break, it's gonna break. If it ain't broke, it's gonna break. Okay, if you wait for your roof to leak before you fix it and you do the maintenance, that's dumb. You actually have more stuff that you have to fix because you, then you've got the water in your house. You actually fix your roof before it breaks. Yeah, and if you want to be, have the most effective health and mental health service, you don't wait for things to break. You know that there are certain stresses. You know that there are problems. You know that transitions between school and uh, university are a problem. You know that transitions out of work are a problem. You know that unemployment's a problem. We know that poor housing's a problem. We know that homelessness is a problem. 
We can do something about that. It's predictable. We know it's going to break people. We need to do an intervention. And so that's why you have to think through needs, or we have to think through needs when we're thinking about how we're going to set up our, our uh, services. Three quick pieces of research from uh, Toronto. Um, the first piece of research um, was based on the fact that we were thinking of um, setting up services and uh, I came to Canada and I kept on looking at Stats Can, uh, Stats Statistics Canada data and it talked about black people and I didn't know what that was. Um, uh, and, you know, and so I thought, well, black seems to be the same in the eyes of Stats Canada. Should it be the same in the ideas of service providers? So we did a little bit of work in uh, Canada, in Toronto, looking at the history of Torontonians. Uh, then trying to dissect the idea and work out what refugees might need, um, what recent economic migrants might need, what the established migrant groups might need, and uh, said, well, you know, how can they be one group? Then um, we uh, looked at where people were coming from and found that even if you took the three biggest groups, you got 55% if you looked at Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago, or Ghana, which meant that you had people from just about everywhere where there was somebody who was black. Then we started saying, where are people and what the services look like? And um, the downtown Toronto uh, is here, and the darker colors show the higher proportion of immigrants, so we got downtown Toronto here, and we've got the diverse populations in the suburbs. Then we started mapping where people of African and Caribbean origin were. And you don't have to be able to read the maps. All you can see is that there are different shapes. And we found that the African origin population and the Caribbean origin population in Toronto were actually living in different areas. And so the idea that people kept on saying the black community didn't really mean anything in Toronto because there seemed to be a number of African and Caribbean origin communities with some overlap but significant differences. And the reason we did this was because we were trying to work out how you produce services that really meet the needs of community, so we wanted to understand community. So we went on and we started off with the most serious mental health problems. And in the most serious mental health problems, we wanted to look at a psychosis and we wanted to look at, um, well, let me, I've got the two ideas the wrong way around. <coughs> we decided we wanted to look at the rates of psychosis in uh, people of, uh, in immigrant groups. And um, the Citizen Immigration Canada have a database of everybody who has come to Canada. And in three provinces, they've linked it to health service usage. So we were able to look at um, the rates of psychosis in new immigrant groups. And you'll probably know from the literature, the literature sh says that immigrants are at a higher risk of developing uh, psychosis than other groups. What we found was that this was not true in Ontario. We found that East Asian immigrants were at lower risk. In fact, they had half the risk of developing psychosis compared to people who are Canadian born. South Asian groups were in the middle. That people from Bermuda and the Caribbean had twice the risk and that uh, people from Africa who were not uh, refugees did not have an increased risk. So we found there was a difference between groups of African origin, people of Caribbean origin, people of South Asian origin, and people, of, and people who were born in Canada. So there were, there were differences even within the immigrant groups. So, but we also wanted to see um, you know, look at services, and uh, we went on from that to say, well, you know, what do the services look like? And uh, we were interested in psychosis 
And so we wanted to look at whether how people got services, because delaying getting services produces poorer outcomes. And also, if you access services through the prison justice system, again, you are likely to have poorer outcomes. So we did a mapping study. And we found, again, that there were differences between the people who are African and Caribbean origin. DUP stands for Delay in Untreated Psychosis. And we found for the um, African population, it was nine months. Think of, think of being 15, 16, maybe 17, last year of high school. You start developing a mental health problem and it takes you nine months to get into early intervention services because we were looking at early intervention services. That is that period of IQ, EQ development uh, interrupted. And then if you, if you get better and you recover and you go back to school, then you have to deal with the emotional problem of being behind your peers, of going into a new classroom. And again, you get disruption. So if you get early treatment, it's a trajectory that you allow people to continue on. But we were shocked when we looked at the Caribbean population. 17 months on average from first symptoms to getting help. 17 months. So that's not just one school year. Okay, That is two school years, and that is very difficult to recover from. 17 months. Um, not saying it was that much better for anybody. Eight months for the European, eight months for the world, you, white, you, European. But the interesting thing, and the one thing you need to think about, was that most of the delay was not due to services. Now, services had their own problems. Uh, and I'll show you a nightmare slide of what happens if you get yourself into the system in Toronto. So services have their own problems, but at least half or more than half of the delay was people coming forward to services. And almost all, of, it was a year's delay in the Caribbean group was people coming to services. And everybody will say that's something like, uh, you know, health literacy, just teach people. But then actually some of it was due to trust, cultural competence, services being inaccessible, and the fear out there that what's going to happen when people get to services is they're going to be drugged up and then, you know, uh, put back into the community with no supports. And so, yeah, one can always teach people, but we've always got to look at ourselves in services and what are we doing to, to stop that. Because there are a lot of services in Toronto. The average person, before they got into early intervention services, had seen five different people. It looked like that. Yeah. So these are, to get into early intervention services, the, the or average person went to the emergency department. The emergency department sent them to their GP their family doctor, their family doctor sent them to a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist sent them to the emergency department, the emergency department then sent them into hospital, and then the hospital, uh, the, the hospital admitted them, and then after admission admitted them, sent to the now not very early intervention services. <laughs> okay? Uh, that was the, that, that's what happened to people, and it didn't matter whether you came in in the emergency department or the general practitioner or the outpatient psychiatrist or any other route, you still went round and round and round in circles before you got to early intervention services. Uh, now, we can do something about that. We can decrease that. We can try and produce one, one uh, access point, and that's what we're trying to do. But still, that only gets us halfway there. The question is, what do you do about getting people to present early? So, five quick things, one slide each, don't worry. Okay, 
ideas to stuff, work in progress, ideas to take away. Uh, I've talked about the big why, the big picture. I've given you a bit of research. And now I'll just tell you some things that I want you to steal. Um, if anybody's ever worried about ideas and worried about stealing ideas, there is a l piece of research that has been done, and actually it was done by Apple, which shows the, um, uh, yeah, you, you, you're laughing before I've even said it. <laughs> it. It shows that the more willing you are to give away ideas, the more ideas you have, okay? Yeah? Now, none of you believe that because you know they stole the iPad idea <laughs> and they made a huge amount of money out of it. But the truth is that the, more, the happier you are to share ideas, the more ideas come your way. And the more you try to hold on to them, the fewer ideas you have. All of your energy is linked on protecting rather than generating and creating. It's waste, 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 waste. Because the truth is, if you had the idea, though I know you're all special, Okay, but if you've had the idea, someone else in the world has had that idea, okay? Uh, and ideas are never about having the idea, they're always about implementation. Innovation is almost never about having a new idea. It is about taking an idea from somewhere else and bringing it into your area of expertise. That's how people innovate. So someone else is gonna have done it. Share liberally, you'll be fine. Health equity impact assessment, you do this. No, okay, it's online, it's there, it's a way, it's a tool developed by the Ontario Ministry. We've got training online. Uh, uh, you'll see me just for a few seconds, uh, so don't worry. Uh, other people are there. Uh, it's an online training and what it is, is it helps you think through decisions. It's a simple thing. Most inequities are not because people have gone out of their way. Most health people, most social services, most psychology, most psychiatry do not get up in the morning and say, we want to produce inequitable services. They usually come because people do not give it the right attention. And health equity impact assessment is just a tool when you're making a decision of saying, does this promote equity or does it diminish equity, and if it diminishes equity, are there things we can do to mitigate that impact? And so, say for instance, we had a simple thing where we were setting up a community health center, and we could choose two or three different sites. We did a simple health equity impact assessment and said, well, just a second, if all of these sites are the same, if we put it here, and we put the data next to it, we actually increase access to diverse populations. The building's not quite so good, but that actually improves equity. If we put it here, it actually decreases access, so why don't we just put it there? And, and it's easy. The person who was most excited by this in the Center for Addiction and Mental Health was the chief operating officer who said, anything, any quotes that come through that are over half a million dollars, I want a health equity impact assessment. And you think about that, that means that all of the big proposals, you have to think of uh, equity. And there's a tool, there's a training, there is a community of interest to help people use it. There are, there's a whole site, it's up there on the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in Ontario. Steal it, steal it. Refugee mental health training, paid for by CIC. Sorry. I should have done a health warning. I can send you these. I'll send you them. <laughs> I'm worried about you getting RSI. You, won't, you will not be able to keep, keep up, and then you'll be upset with me, and I don't like that. I'll, I'll send you these. You, you can have them. Yeah? Refugee mental health training. We are going to try and work out how we can get you this. It is an online but facilitated training. It's paid for by CIC. It's a lovely training pack. Uh, you can, you know, we have about 500 people a year going through that training uh, paid for by CIC. We've just translated it into French and we've got our first 500 people going through in French. Um, and we're working on a deal with CIC to spread it. 
Um, but if you want it quickly, contact me and we'll see if we can work something out. But again, steal it. This you have to steal, okay? Uh, we've actually even got the booklets. I haven't got them with me, but we've got booklets and you can have them. And we have trainers and they'll come. We went to the Caribbean and African communities in Toronto and we said, what do we need to do in order to make cognitive behavioral therapy, which we know works for depression and anxiety, more accessible and more effective for the population? And um, we did this, again, funded by uh, Citizen Immigration Canada, Ontario. We did this over a two-year period, and we created Please Wrap Up. <laughs> no. Um, so, um, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> but thank you. You said please. So I, I just thought it was a question. Or... No, I've got three slides, and, and yeah. So I, I, will, I will finish. I will finish. Um, and we culturally adapted CBT with a manual. Uh, one of the things it does is it helps free up therapists. Therapists think they have to stick really um, uh, strictly to the manual, uh, which means that they can't keep contact with people. Uh, some of the uh, communities were saying, well, you know, if we could just send every now and then an email or something to the therapist saying, you know, I've graduated, you know, family's doing well, happy Christmas. It makes us feel like there is a connection. In classic therapy, you can't do that. Um, sorry? You do that there, yeah? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But sometimes, you know, if you can give somebody a manual and say, it's okay. Yeah. That works, and we've shown it works. Um, if you can uh, have a conversation about homework, and what that should look like, or no homework in cognitive behavioral therapy. If in that wonderful book, because Mind Over Mood is a great book, but if the examples actually look like people of African uh, Canadian origin and have real problems that the communities uh, have to deal with, that makes a difference. Um, and um, we rolled it out, it works, and now we've got money to roll it out in one of our community health centers called Women's Health and Women's Hands, which looks after African-Canadian women. And um, we've, got the, we've got the modules, we've got the booklets, steal them. One of the things we did in CAMH, which um, I just wanted to talk about because it was a smart move, is everybody who came in to the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health when I, where I work, had to do a course called Diversity 101. Everybody had to do it. It was part of the courses we had to do, just like fire training. Everybody had to do it. Nobody really wanted to do it. Everybody had to do it. On top of that, we had some cultural competence training and various other modules that we wanted people to do, but we couldn't get high levels of take-up. So what we did is we got all of the courses that we had in um, CAMH, we streamlined them, put them together as one course, went to the University of Toronto, said, can you accredit them as a diploma course? And they said, yeah, we can credit them as a diploma course. You get a certain number of credits for each one of the bits of the course you do, and you make it up over two or three years, and you get a diploma in health equity. We said, that's great. So now everybody who comes in and does Diversity 101 gets a credit. And because they get a credit, they're sort of more likely to take up the other courses because over a two, three year period, they can get a diploma in health equity and it's accredited by the University of Toronto. And then that gets them uh, chances for a, a, a better job. Uh, and so everybody, and so just by that smart move of taking things we're already doing, pushing them together, getting them accredited, understanding a bit of uh, what people want and people need, which is a diploma, we've got the uptake of all of our courses increased. So people are doing more cultural competent work. And yeah, I know that some people are never going to use it, and some people just want the um, uh, they want the information or the, or the diploma, but that doesn't matter. At least they're educated. Yeah. So that's one of the things that we did. 
look on that site. This is some work we did, funded by PHAC. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Across boundaries. So with a group called Across Boundaries. Um, this is with youth, and so have a look at it. What it's got on it, uh, we went to youth and say, what do we need to do to improve mental health? And they said, you need a site that helps us find services. So we have a map with all the services on them. They just need to pinpoint where they live on the map and the near, nearest child uh, uh, service comes up. They wanted games, so we have video games, um, which shows them what happens if you take too much drugs and various other things. They wanted information, they wanted poetry, they wanted stories, they wanted cartoons. We made some of them, we pulled others of them together, and they wanted to see other youth, and they wanted to see racialized youth. And so there's maybe an hour's worth of little vignettes of asking youth, what do you think of mental health? What is mental health? How do you get help? All of those sorts of things. It's there. Use it. It's even got lesson plans for uh, teachers. So it's there. Steal it. Uh, and the last uh, thing um, I won't talk very much about, because I am going to respect the time of the other speakers and stop. OK? I started late. Yeah? Yeah. OK. I I'm in trouble. <laughs> OK. And this is a what if. What if Canada was as easy to work in as Kenya? OK. We tried to produce a whole school approach to mental health in Toronto. Got nowhere. Got Canadian money and went to Kenya, and they said yes. So what we have in Kenya is a, a project called KIDS. We go into, we've gone into schools, two, schools, uh, two school districts, 5,000 kids. We set up um, EQ development in schools. So we do social skills, we do conflict resolution, we do a bit of mindfulness, we do a bit of CBT. We teach kids that, peer to peer. So we teach kids to teach kids and those are the kids' clubs. We have community groups for parents about how to uh, help your kid through school, how to understand what mental illness is and how to keep your kid doing well. Uh, and then we have teacher clubs. We sort of teach the teachers how to do these um, uh, social skills type groups, but really what we're doing is trying to teach teachers how to um, be nice to kids, yeah. how to have the soft skills. Nobody teaches teachers how to work in a group, how, to, how group dynamics work, how you can produce a nurturing group. So that's sort of what we're trying to teach teachers. And then we add to that link workers linking the school directly to primary care so that people with mental health problems who are identified through this bubbling up of either things that are happening in the kids' clubs, things that are happening at the teacher level, or things that, uh, or the awareness of the parents, how that, uh, you know, they, we find people and we get them into care quickly. So that's being paid for by the Canadian government and is going very, very well. We've reached over 5,000 kids so far. And uh, the interesting thing for us is the people who gave us an office was the Department of Education, not the Department of Health. And the Department of Education, going full circle, believed that mental health, soft skill development, and the development of the social brain was really important for the development of Kenya. And so they think doing this is just the thing you need to do. So, I am out of time. We have been doing lots of bits and pieces and lots of things. 
We've been lucky in that we have been able to get money to do that. Most of the money has been grant money. We've been lucky that we've had the leadership, as there is leadership here, that's interested in it. Uh, but, and, but there are more people over there than they are here. And all I would say is, remember, this is an important big thing you're doing. It, when you find yourselves being caught in the weeds, remember, this is an important big thing you're doing. Yeah? Elevate it. Yeah? And if there's anything we, I can do to help or we can do to help, you know that um, I'm happy to do it. So thank you very much. So maybe we'll take about, oh yeah, it wasn't on. Um, maybe we'll take about uh, oh, five minutes for maybe four or five questions. And then when we finish, uh, we need to vacate the room so they can divide the room. And there's lots of munchies outside. So questions, Michelle has hey. the mic. Questions. So, One over here. I was going to say, because if I'm... Uh, if nobody was going to ask questions, then I was going to, uh, I was going to turn into Oprah, and I was going to come round. <laughs> it's a nervous laughter. <laughs> yeah. So you talked about the healthy immigrant effect, and yeah. uh, I think in the past it was very essentialist, this notion that all immigrants who come to Canada uh, have deteriorating health or mental health about six years after they arrive, and you're saying that distinct groups have different levels of psychosis. How much of that is, can be attributed to conditions before pre-migration issues and the issues or social conditions in Canadian society? So did they come with pre-existing issues? Okay. And so I think there are two different things. So um, the healthy immigrant effect, uh, immigrants who come to Canada tend to be um, better. So if you look at the number, the percentage of people who have poor health. Uh, newcomers, it's about 4%. Canadian average, it's about 8%. Long-term immigrants, it's about 14%. Uh, over time, the 4% of people with poor health who are newcomers over the seven years goes up to 16%. So you have a four-fold increase in problems over a seven-year period. But it's not true for all immigrants. So for health in general, not just for psychosis, Moving from, poor health, from good health to poor health only happens if you are a visible minority. If you're a non-visible minority, your health advantage continues. Okay? So visible minorities uh, are the people who change from having, poor health to, uh, from having good health to poor health. That's what happens. It is different for different minority groups and different illnesses. So psychosis particularly, it seems, in people of African and Caribbean origin. Refugees have a 20% increase, so that's your group who've got big, a large amounts of pre-migratory issues. Uh, that increases your risk by about 20%. It doesn't account for the issues. Um, it seems that it, it is the post-migration conditions, not the pre-migration conditions, that are important for decreasing the risk in some groups and increasing the risk in others. But we don't know exactly what those conditions are. So one of the studies we're trying to do at the moment is we're trying to get a stress wristband that sends us information uh, through the internet. And we're going to give that to different uh, ethnic groups and see how that works, yeah, to try and see you know, what is going on in those populations and whether it is just stress, whether it's the way people react to stress, or whether it's everyday hassles that cause a problem. But we know that racism is a problem, and we know that the darker skinned you are, the more racism you have. Uh, the only wrinkle to that being Muslim, so if you're Muslim, you get a lot of racism. Okay? They just want you walking around. 
It's because you put that thing up that told me to finish. <laughs> they, they, they're getting their own back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Dr. Kwan. I really enjoyed your presentation very much so. I'm curious around the part you talked about, the social brain. And as you may or may not be aware of, I'm sure you are aware, many of our parents in our African Nova Scotian communities or communities of people of African descent often have to work those two jobs or are doing other things. And so where you talk about the importance of the social brain and the role that the parents play in helping to develop that, as well as the school, is there a way for kids who may not have developed that social brain um, as a child for parents to help develop that as a youth? Or does it have to start at a certain age? And how would you go about developing that social brain if your time is limited to be able to spend that time with your child? Yeah, and, and the important thing is if we were having this conversation 10 years ago, um, people would have said, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what you're going to talk about. You're going to be talking about this later? Oh, I'm talking about it now. Okay, <laughs> so, um, uh, so people would have said, that's that. What people have found, of course, now um, is all of this work on neuroplasticity shows that you can develop skills at mostly any age, as long as you, you just, it takes more the older you get to learn the skills. But yeah, the reason why we're doing kids and we're trying to do that social uh, brain development in schools is because you can do it in schools. You can teach people those sorts of skills at any age. You can learn mindfulness at the age of 70. <laughs> yeah, You can always do it. It's just that it takes more, so you have to put more in um, the older people are. Have you ever come across, there's a chap called James Heckman, Nobel laureate from Chicago. And he does uh, something called the Heckman Curve. And it shows your, um, your return on investment depending on age. And essentially, there's hugely more return on investment the younger you do things. So you have to invest more the older people are in order to uh, get change. But people are not doomed from the womb. People are not doomed in, in, in uh, preschool. Uh, if you can do it in preschool, that's great. If not, you can get going at any age. We can do one more question, and then I see them looming to close the room up. Any more? OK. Well. Oh, well, there's one oh, here. sorry. Oh, yeah. So the resources be for developing the social brain, would those resources be? Oh, sorry. The resources for curriculum to actually do the, the social skill development, the social brain development in youth. Would they be on that more than a label website? Is that the best place no. to go to get that? Uh, no, I would have to get them. And this is this is typical. Uh, I'd have to get them sent from Kenya. Wow. <laughs> yeah, because we produced a package. That's where we produced a package, uh, and so it's all local. But you know, if you go to Lethbridge, they're doing amazing work in Lethbridge. If you go to Pittsburgh, they're doing great work there. Um, there are lots of people. You know, as I said, there's no like, uh, I, I don't do new stuff, I just steal stuff. That's why I say, you know, just carry on stealing. I just want stuff. a place to steal it from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there are loads of people doing this because it's hot at the moment. It works. Everybody knows it. And now some people are just putting it into concrete modules. But you'll find it everywhere. Just look at social brain development. Okay. All right. So, on so. behalf of the our, our group gathered here, I'd like to thank you very much. I'm sorry we rushed you. No, you did not rush me. I just, I just speak too much, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. And we will steal some of your information. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming to get me. Oh, no problem. I take you back. Oh, do you?